Welcome back. Well, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques has now soared past the 100-day mark in space. The ninth Canadian in orbit has been spending some of his time up there on scientific experiments, operating the Canada Arm, even fixing a leaky toilet at some point. But what else has Saint-Jacques been doing? Well, W5's Peter Ackman had the opportunity to ask. Good morning. Let's have a look outside. Welcoming a new day aboard the International Space Station, David Saint-Jacques opens the shutter doors, covering the 360-degree cupola lookout windows. Welcome to the cupola. Have a good day. Far below Earth, a massive and ever-changing reminder of why he's come to space. Houston, this is station. I am ready. W5, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Peter Ackman. How do you hear me? Peter, I have you loud and clear. How me? Salut, David. Thanks for doing this. Welcome on board. W5 was given permission to interview David one-on-one -on -one from the ISS. Okay, David, now that you're in space, uh, you're 400 kilometers above Earth, uh, what was that first impression that you and I talked so much about? The first thing I did is uh, asked to be uh, go to the cupola just to see the size of the Earth, uh, just to kind of grasp for the first time that, that view uh, is something I'll never forget. You can't des describe how beautiful our planet is seen from up here. It actually, it glows and it breathes and you can tell it's the only living thing around. Seven, six. Getting there was anything but smooth. Four, three, two, one. Nearly two months before his launch, near disaster struck another Russian Soyuz rocket carrying two astronauts up to the ISS. Standby. Emergency. The failure of the booster. The ballistic descent command is sent from root controller. Copy. And we have the escape tower for the Soyuz now jettisoned. While no one was injured, the mission was scrubbed and the entire program immediately put on hold to investigate. Then on December 3rd, 2018, with little notice, David's three-person team was told to get ready. The crew departed the Cosmonaut Hotel and boarded the bus for the ride to the integration and suit-up facility. Family members of the astronauts were allowed one final visit. David's wife and children said their goodbyes through safety glass. The astronauts were blessed. Then they were suited up and readied by Russian engineers. And finally, it was time. Nine years of training culminating in this single moment. Engines have started and are now at the preliminary thrust level, throttling up and lift off. We have lift off of Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko blasting through the Kazakh sky to the International Space Station. And this time, everything went perfectly. From the launch to the docking with the space station. And capture. We have capture, and um, station is in Copy. Once they arrived, the crew got right to work on their six and a half month mission. David admits it took some time to get used to his new home and the lack of gravity. As soon as I was upside down, I was lost. I didn't know where, where to go. And I was a very bad flyer initially, like most astronauts for the first time, crashing into the walls everywhere as I move around. But while it was challenging at first, like seemingly everything else David has tried in his life, he quickly became a master of zero-gravity flight. Uh, I knew it would be fun to fly, but I, I had no idea it would be this fun, that you could just turn around like this and fly. And actually, what I'm surprised is that now I find it normal. Isn't that amazing how incredibly adaptive we are? So that's an incredible thing, how much we can adapt. David's time will be spent conducting dozens of medical experiments, all focused on the impact of space on the human body, with the long-term goal of making extended space travel for humans to other distant planets not only possible, but safe. David's background makes him eminently qualified for this job. On top of being as physically fit as any professional athlete, he speaks five languages fluently, including Russian and Japanese. And before joining the space program, he earned degrees in engineering and a PhD in astrophysics, before finally graduating to become a medical doctor. 
He then spent months caring for an Inuit community in Canada's north. You, you have such a, a, a wide ranging and, and broad experience in life. Has everything you've done culminated in this point? It seems like every day I realize that uh, I have, uh, I've had some experience in my life that helps me with this particular task. And, uh, you know, um, very, very fortunate that the stars have lined up like this. David Saint-Jacques. Since being chosen to be an astronaut in 2009, David has spent the last decade training traveling to Star City in Russia, the once secret Cold War cosmonaut space facility working on the exact replica of the ISS, learning to fly the Soyuz rocket and training to withstand the body crushing takeoffs and landings in a centrifuge. His second home was in Houston. There he was put through every life-threatening scenario that NASA could think of. He also spent days underwater learning to work and survive in outer space. Okay, so this is a good position yeah. for you. What has stood out to you that's different than maybe you had expected? One thing that uh, keeps surprising me is uh, how much they, act, they trust us here. On the ground, we're used to, you know, a lot of people double checking everything we do, technicians with white gloves handling everything, and here it's just us. And of course, that is maybe the main uh, quality that's requested uh, of a crew member uh, to be trustworthy uh, because they, you know, they gave us the key to the, the humanity's spaceship. While aboard the ISS, David is involved in a wide spectrum of research projects. One getting a lot of attention is a Canadian invention called the Biomonitor Smart Shirt, a wearable medical system designed to continuously record his vital signs in real time. It takes an entire team to set up the medical monitoring system. But once it's calibrated, everything from David's blood pressure to his heart rate and even oxygen levels are immediately broadcast back down to Earth. Perry Johnson Green is the head of life and physical sciences for the Canadian Space Agency. Long term, what do you think will come of David's experiments? We're going to be finding out lots more about how bones react at a very, very fine structural level, which we don't, we haven't had that information before. Uh, we'll be finding out again the cardiovascular effects in terms of the really risk for uh, you know uh, something like a type 2 diabetic response which, which we think is one of the risks of really long duration spaceflight. Living in space is dangerous often compared to contracting a degenerative disease. Under zero gravity the body immediately starts to break down. Muscles atrophy, eyes are strained and bones become brittle. It takes many astronauts, once back down on Earth, days to walk again, unaided. And then they spent months, if not years, in intensive physiotherapy. Fighting off those effects is why David spent years getting his body ready for this mission. And while on the ISS, he constantly stretches and uses resistance trainers. But while the awkward sports equipment helps, the slow physical deterioration of the human body at zero gravity is inevitable. Have you felt any of those effects while you're in space in the time you've been there? So, it, you know, it was difficult initially to adjust. It took me several weeks before I could really feel back to being normal. And now, you know, it's it, It's as if I was born here in zero gravity. I can be upside down, ups, anywhere around. I can turn around fast, take corners. I've learned to fly. And uh, it's as if I was born here. But it wasn't like that all the time. Initially, congestion was annoying. I had some headaches. And I was very, very e easily disoriented, both in time and in space, because of the lack of the, you know, our clockwork uh, sunrise and sunset we used to on Earth. Here, every hour and a half is a new sunrise and a new sunset. So I was disoriented and feeling strange for several weeks. But now, uh, it's as if I was born here. Do you have any nervousness about when you get back to Earth, what your body will be like? Yeah, I expect it to be at least as difficult to adapt to back to Earth as it was to adapt coming up here. A sense of disorientation, bad balance, maybe feeling weak. I might be able to walk straight without holding someone's hand. I think it's going to take several days or maybe weeks. What's the benefit of having David, who is in excellent shape, but also a medical doctor, that awareness both about his own body, but also about the, the workings of the human body? Because he was a working MD, and particularly an MD from a remote, isolated area in northern Quebec, he really saw the value of things like biomonitor in terms of giving uh, medical doctors information that they just can't get it uh, right now. 
So this is where I saw the real enthusiasm of David, who's really engaged in the human research. I think partly because of the because you know, he's an MD and has that natural natural curiosity, being a scientist as well. The hope is there could also be some more down-to-earth applications for the experiments David is conducting in space. So what you could also discover, I guess potentially, is how to reverse the effects of inactivity here on Earth. Yes. And that's why, uh, that's why the, the researchers on, in, that we've talked to in Canada are really excited about this because it gives you a real nice model where you don't have any what we call confounding factors of you know, other kinds of disease or anything. We have very healthy people and we can see the problems that arose just from inactivity. It's really quite interesting. For David, he's always been willing to sacrifice everything, including his own health, for this mission. This is my job. This is the point of space station, is to be a, a laboratory and to do research that helps us go further into the cosmos, but ultimately comes back to Earth to help uh, medicine for everybody. The future of space travel research, all done here, orbiting 400 kilometers above the Earth. Life, 400 kilometers above the planet. Fly me to the moon. I wish I could take everybody up with me here. Has its down-to-earth problems. The only problem is I can't call a professional plumber if I need help. When W5 continues. Long before traveling to outer space was David Saint-Jacques' mission, it was his dream. One unbeknownst to him, he had been training for his entire life. As a young boy growing up in Quebec, he says he knew someday he would get there, he just never knew how. I've always been fascinated by space, but for most of my life, I never really thought it was even an option. David's journey to the launch pad in Kazakhstan in December of 2018 may have taken many twists and turns. And lift off. We have lift off. But from the moment he left the Earth's atmosphere, it was clear this is where David was destined to be. Fly me to the moon. I wish I could take everybody up with me here and then beyond to the moon and then to Mars. I think it would be amazing if everybody could have this experience. So I can't. So I'm trying to share as much of the emotion with you. Hurtling around the Earth every 92 minutes at over 28,000 kilometers an hour, the crew aboard the ISS sees 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. And while the views from 400 kilometers above Earth are spectacular, David admits living for months in this remote and dangerous outpost far from Earth takes its toll, not only physically, but mentally. So the problem you you develop here is that everything is a little bit the same every day. It can be depressing sometimes if you're not careful. You're very, very far away from the people you love on Earth, and that can make you sad, perhaps. You're always with the same people on board, so if conflict arises, it can be you have nowhere to go. Uh, you have to face it. So it is, a, it is a challenge. We prepare a lot for this as astronauts. David and the other astronauts do have ways of escaping. They can email, phone, or even video call the ones they love. For David, the ones he misses most are his three children, Pierre, Léon, and Sophie. And of course, his wife, Veronique. You guys uh, Skype or FaceTime or whatever the equivalent is from space. Yeah. Like, what are, what are the emotions like for him when he sees the kids? Of course, we, we all miss each other in, in certain moments. Yeah. We've prepared for this. We send him crew care packages every month with things from home. Um, he has things with him. He has a little doll from Sophie. The boys each chose a toy for him to keep with him. Toys and notes from the kids that are sent up in the monthly supply transports, bringing up much needed food and equipment. Good contact. <laughs> for the duration of his mission, they've moved back to Canada from their home in Houston to a condo in Montreal, a temporary home closer to extended family and support. But being a single parent is nothing new to Veronique. Pierre told me, Mom, we were, we're well trained for this. You know, we are, we are well trained. It's been uh, two and a half years of diving, being on and off, and more, more gone than not. 
And so we've gotten into uh, our routine, our own life. And um, so that, that training comes in handy for us as well. We were ready for this. While Veronique and the kids' lives go on as usual with school and chores, David works to be part of the family's hectic schedule. For an hour a week in the morning, he gets to talk to them live via video link. And every time, whether in Montreal or aboard the ISS, they all eat the same breakfast. What are those conversations like? Just like normal? We really like to find ways to connect in very concrete ways because that's what the kids need. Uh, often they will eat waffles together in the morning. We like to eat those on the weekend and David has those on station as well with maple syrup. So the kids will all sit and eat their waffles and David does the same. Will you be eating any waffles when you get back to Earth or will you be sick of them by the time you're done this, this, this trip? You heard about that, yes. That's one of the few things that we found. We haven't come in here. I can have breakfast uh, with my kids and we eat, uh, we share waffles with maple syrup uh, that I brought specially up here. And uh, that's a hit. But the waffles aren't just for eating, they're also a tool to help the kids learn more about science and space. Do the kids want science experiments? They get their own private science show from from space. Also, well, putting maple syrup on a waffle is is quite something. You know, they see the bubble of uh, of uh, of syrup yeah. just bulging out of, and then David just scooping it with the waffle. Since it's it's in the con the context of normal life, yeah. they just completely integrate it as normal. Yeah. David and his family have rarely known normal. For the last two and a half years, he's been traveling all over the world learning how to be an astronaut. You've been away from your family a long time. Is this different being off the planet versus just being in another country? Yeah, there is, a, there is an extra sense of uh, remoteness. There is an extra sense of uh, also kind of recognizing uh, that really my family, my wife, uh, really have uh, maybe the most important, biggest job in all this to make sure that the mission overall is a success, that I have the peace of mind to uh, go through it uh, correctly and do my tasks. But while being in outer space sounds glamorous, being responsible for the $200 billion International Space Station isn't all stargazing and scientific breakthroughs. Daily, David has a list of chores he needs to complete, from unpacking supply deliveries from Earth, to putting on his tool belt, and repairing onboard mechanical and electrical issues. Oh, we have a space plumber. On this day, he had the unsavory yet important task of fixing one of the space station's toilets. Is it just just like uh, just like at home? Yes. Just a couple pipes. Yes. The the, the uh, only problem is I can't call a professional plumber if I need help. The best thing about being an astronaut, I think, is how varied the job is. One day you're flying a rocket, that's amazing. One day you're looking at the planet from space, that's also amazing. But one day you have to repair the toilet. That said, with David's mission more than half over, he still has several more amazing tasks he'd like to accomplish. On this day, he unpacked and tested his spacesuit, with the hope that before he goes home, he'll actually get to use it and do a spacewalk outside the ISS. What are you hoping to do in space before you leave? Uh, on your bucket list of things to do, I, I surely hope I get to use a Canad arm, a robotic arm up here, uh, the pride of our uh, space program. I certainly hope I get the chance to do a spacewalk. Uh, you know, we, we don't decide these things, but uh, I am ready and trained. And uh, there's a saying that says, you know, the true measure of a successful space mission is that the crew wants to go back again as a crew. And you'd like to go back again, obviously. Certainly, this has been a, a tremendous uh, adventure that we're going through uh, together. We're really like brothers and sisters up here. The team's mission is called Perspective, and that's what David says he gets every time he peers out the ISS windows down onto Earth and all its inhabitants, seemingly floating alone in this vast universe. It brings home very clearly the fact that when you see our beautiful planet floating in the black of space, there's no tube with no new air. There's no tube with new water. All we have is there on Earth. Mother Earth is an incredible recycling machine, and we have to take good care of Mother Earth. And David Saint-Jacques is expected to return to Earth in July.